Hello everyone, my name is Guy Davidson and I'm the Principal Coding Manager at Creative Assembly, makers of the Total War franchise and other fine games. I've been there since 1999 and my role is to make our great programmers into even greater programmers. I want to talk to you today about linear algebra and the continuing attempts to introduce a matrix class and infix operators into the standard library. But I'd like to take a moment to talk about this. The biggest problem we have in the C++ community is that there are more problems to solve than engineers to solve them, especially at this time. We need problem solvers to work on the hard problems. Historically, software engineering has been an inclusive environment. For example, Margaret Hamilton was director of the Software Engineering Division of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Instrumentation Laboratory, which developed onboard flight software for NASA's Apollo program. She is one of the people credited with coining the term software engineering. Now, however, we appear to be heavily biased towards white men and have very low gender and ethnicity diversity. And we as a species need to fix this. And if you're interested in helping, please visit the website and join the Discord server. Thank you. So here's what to expect. We'll start with a speedy refresher on what linear algebra is then talk about the nature of a linear algebra library. Then we'll look at the library being proposed and how to customize it for your own use. We'll look at an application to color space management and finally a simple application to geometry. So let's answer this question first. It's the branch of mathematics concerning linear equations and linear functions and their representation through matrices and vector spaces. A linear equation looks like this. It's the sum of some products of coefficients and unknowns. And it has application to geometry for modeling the Cartesian representation of space. Color is typically represented as a triple of values and there are useful things you can do when manipulating color spaces. Solving simultaneous equations is probably the first piece of linear algebra any of you did via row reduction. In fact, linear algebra underpins most modern mathematics. It has applications in machine learning, which is just number crunching, if you heard Kevin's talk on Thursday. Now, most textbooks will start with the vector or even the scalar, but we're going to start at the matrix and work backwards for reasons which will become apparent. A matrix is an M by N rectangular array of scalar elements. And that word array is troublesome, and it's not the last time we will have glossary issues. Just as with the real number field, there are operations that you can carry out on matrices that match the scalar operations. You can perform matrix scalar multiplication. This involves multiplying each element by the same scalar value. You can perform matrix addition, but this is somewhat constrained. You can only add matrices of the same dimension. And that use of the word dimension is also problematic. The dimension of a matrix is the number of rows and columns it contains. It's nothing to do with geometry. There is no such thing as a three-dimensional matrix. Addition takes place member-wise, which is why the operation is so constrained. As well as scalar multiplication, there is matrix multiplication. And again, this is constrained by requiring that the number of columns in the left operand match the number of rows in the right operand. So this constraint is due to the mechanism of multiplication. It's performed by calculating the dot product of every row and column combination, retrieving the row from the left-hand operand and the column from the right-hand operand. The dot product is itself a sort of linear equation. It is the sum of the member-wise products of the elements. And you can see in the example, the top left element in the, in the result matrix is formed from the dot product of the first row and column. Since we're taking rows from one operand and columns from the other, matrix multiplication is not necessarily commutative. And there is a special kind of matrix called a square matrix. This has the same number of rows and columns. There's a special kind of square matrix called the identity matrix. The leading diagonal, that is those elements whose row and column index are the same, is populated with one or other elements are zero. Multiplying any matrix by the identity matrix 
or vice versa, leaves the matrix unchanged. There is an interesting property of a square matrix called the determinant. It's a single value like a modulus that captures information about the matrix, much like a median or a mode or a mean captures information about a set of numbers. Its calculation is the subject of considerable research efforts since it is used in several ways, and we'll see one very soon. A matrix can also have an inverse. The product of a matrix and its inverse is the identity matrix. No surprises there. And we see that there are some analogues to the built-in types. There are well-defined meanings to the arithmetic operators, although post-increment and ordering are not really available. One might choose to order by determinant, but that's an unusual activity that I've yet to find a use for, and it's only applicable to square matrices. The vector is a special kind of matrix. It has only one row or column, and a single row matrix may be called a row vector, and a single column matrix may be called a column vector. The multiplication has two different forms, each with their own name. So the inner product is the name given to the multiplication of a matrix with a single row by a matrix with a single column. This is achieved by performing a single dot product. As you can see, this will yield a scalar value. The outer product is the name given to the multiplication of a matrix with a single column by a matrix with a single row. This will, of course, yield a matrix. We have something of an abstraction problem here in that matrix products take several forms. We also have a naming problem, of course, vector is already in use, being the most commonly used container. Um, you could implement a linear algebra vector in terms of a std vector and a matrix in terms of a std vector of std vectors, but that will be suboptimal for many uses. So let's try an example of uh, example use of this and solve a simultaneous equation. Uh, so this is ax plus by equals e and cx plus dy equals f. This can be written as a matrix product. The left-hand matrix is formed from the coefficients and the right-hand matrix contains a single column and is formed from the variables. The result is also a single column matrix or column vector. So let's call the coefficient matrix M. And via algebra, we multiply both sides by the inverse, and we have to take care to respect operand order since multiplication is not commutative. So all we need to do to solve a pair of simultaneous equations like this is find the inverse of the coefficient matrix. So let's try an example. 2x plus 3y equals 8, and x minus 2y equals negative 3. We form the coefficient matrix and calculate the inverse. Um, inverses are reasonably simple for 2 by 2 matrices. The determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix is formed from the product of the leading diagonal minus the product of the trailing diagonal. I call it trailing diagonal, I don't know if there's a formal name. The adjugate of a 2 by 2 matrix is formed by transposing the leading diagonal and multiplying the trailing diagonal by negative 1. So, with a little arithmetic, and a little substitution. We arrive at the solution, and I'll pause there for any questions. Okay, what is a linear algebra library? Well, if you've seen me talk about this earlier, you'll have heard me say, oh, I've written four linear algebra libraries. But actually, I found a fifth. So I wrote a library during my linear algebra course uh, whilst I was studying maths at Sussex University back in the 80s. And I had an Atari ST. Um, I was probably writing linear algebra libraries before this point because I was writing games since 1980. But then I was just doing geometry. I didn't really recognize it as linear algebra. Um, I used fixed point arithmetic. It was probably a linear algebra library, but I, I didn't realize that. Um, but this library, it supported geometry, translation by addition, um, scaling by scalar multiplication, transformation by matrix multiplication, angle computation by dot product, and normal computation by cross product, 
although the cross product's not actually linear algebra, um, which hints at a problem we'll come up against shortly. So then I got my first PC, um, and I had Visual C++ with Microsoft Foundation classes, version 1.0. Um, so I had the same set of operations because I had the same set of problems to solve. My next machine came with a floating point code processor, fantastic. So I moved away from relying on C and embraced C++ fully. Uh, and I joined the games industry in 1997. And when MMX came along, I didn't like having to share floating point with vector instructions. Um, the registers were just dreadful. And I had a hideous time mucking about with them. It wasn't nice. But I got another machine and another processor, and this was SIMD via SSE2, which was lovely. There was a big jump in performance. Um, and still the same set of operations. I'm still solving the same problems in geometry. The ABX processor was lovely. Registers got wider. Um, you can get 512-bit registers now, for goodness sake. Um, and other parts of the team at Creative Assembly are buffing the linear algebra right now. Um, I've stepped away from that. And I said five, of course, there is a sixth, which is um, targeting N4860, programming languages C++, known as C++20. P1385 is a proposal to add linear algebra support to the C++ standard library. I must say the lion's share of this by now is by my co-author, Bob Stiegel, who you may have seen talking about the business value of an API uh, on Thursday. We agreed on the superiority of his approach and we'll discuss this later. So I have several optimizations available to me because of specialization. I know how big all my matrices are going to be. The scalar type is always the 32-bit floating point type. I know about my target processor, so I can use intrinsics and SIMD instructions. I can make use of cache behavior. And my library is optimized for this particular usage, so everything is fixed size and dense. And there are many ways to optimize for other situations, such as sparse matrices of variable size. It's like string classes. Everyone can write the best one for their needs. Fundamentally, though, a linear algebra library consists of a matrix class, a vector class, and even that is questionable if you treat a vector as a special kind of matrix and in fixed operator overloads to operate between them. There are uncontroversial operators like addition, subtraction, and scalar multiplication. However, in the course of the development of this library, the asterisk operator has proven controversial. And I use the word asterisk operator rather than multiply operator advisedly. Ask yourself what the name of this operator is. Did you say bit shift operator? Did you say stream insertion operator? Or did you say chevron operator? You see, it's better to name the operators after the character rather than the common usage. What about this one? Do you call it the subscript operator? Or the array access operator? Or do you call it the square operator? Or square bracket operator? Or bracket operator? At the moment, I have to deploy this syntax using the parenthesis operator. Of course, what I'm used to seeing in textbooks is this spelling. And this is complicated by the comma operator in this context. There was a proposal which was passed for C++20, P1161, which sought to deprecate uses of the comma operator in subscripting expressions. And you can find it in Annex D of the standard. And building on this is P2128, which seeks to enable multidimensional subscripting. And if this goes through, we are freed from such syntaxes as this. So please talk to your national bodies and request that they prioritize this proposal. And the linear algebra proposal, of course, P1385. Remember that number. Anyway, back to operator asterisk. This isn't what you see in textbooks. What you see is this. Obviously, we can't have an operator X. It's the most commonly used variable name. What will become of us all, honestly? If we were allowed Unicode, we could have operator modifier letter small x, which sits within the basic multilingual plane. Although I suspect that's an abuse of a modifying character. 
Also, we have been using the asterisk operator for so long that it would be unusual to revert to something more correct. So what does it mean to multiply two vectors to form a product? Well, while taking this proposal around the committee, I found out that there is a field of pursuit which makes use of something called the Hadamard product, which is simply a member-wise multiplication, and it can be applied to matrices as well as vectors. And to be honest, it makes me slightly queasy. It turns out that the main application of this has nothing to do with linear algebra. It's simply multiplying an array of numbers by another array of numbers in situ. And sadly, this array of numbers is called a vector or a matrix because it looks like a vector or a matrix and is accessed with multidimensional subscripting. Something else we'll come back to later. Of course, there are quite a few libraries out there already. Um, just a simple Wikipedia query yielded plenty more than I knew about. Um, so let's just take a look at two or three. So the granddaddy of them all is BLAS, Basic Linear Algebra Subprograms, first released in 1979 as a Fortran library. It prescribes a set of low-level routines for performing common linear algebra operations. There are also C bindings, which is useful for our purposes, obviously. Um, and there are many implementations optimised for speed on a particular machine. Um, there's a C++ API called, of course, BLAS++, which implements much of the functionality for your linear algebra needs. Here's an example function. Um, BLAS supports single and double float precision and single and double precision complex numbers. I think it probably supports long double flow precision as well. I need to check that. Um, there is also, of course, boost.ublas, um, but the last significant change to ublas was in 2009, so there are no const extra or no except clauses. There are three levels to the BLAS API. Level one contains the vector operations. These names are rather short. I have been told that this is because only the first six characters of Fortran identifiers are significant. This makes it very hard to provide meaningful names. I believe that was the case with C as well, hence Strelen and Stricopy. Level 2 contains the matrix vector operations. And level 3 contains the matrix matrix operations. And this gives us a good starting point for the kind of API we might want. You can see a fair amount of repetition varying on matrix type. We've got Hermitian and symmetric and triangular matrices there, and operands, matrix vector, matrix matrix. And the set of operations is different for vectors from matrices. And it was standardised by the BLAST technical forum, known as BLAST, because why not? I would. There's a companion paper to mine which seeks to introduce a BLAST interface to the standard library, and I welcome this paper, since it would provide a default implementation for our syntax proposal. Next we have Eigen. This is a C++ library with matrix and vector templates. Dimensions can be declared statically or calculated at runtime. And there is a span object for viewing unowned data. The API consists of member functions. And this is another thing that makes me queasy. We have learned the cost of rich member APIs. Stood string is the poster child for this. Um, I should remark that although I have mentioned inverses and determinants, these won't feature in the proposal. We are purely defining the matrix type and the infix operators. We're not defining any member functions beyond the special functions, obviously. We might introduce an identity-free function, but really this is all about, you know, reserving matrix and the infix operators. So here is some sample code using Eigen. Um, looking through that, I, I like the in initialization of vector at the bottom using the chevron operator and a comma separated list. Next we have dlib, which is a vast, vast library of useful things. The matrix classes use expression templates for optimizations such as loop fusion. And I've described this in other talks, so please check those talks or Wikipedia for details. Um, Blaze is written by Klaus Eagleberger. He's a strong supporter of the linear algebra proposal. It's a modern library tuned and customised for many different hardware environments. Similar to Eigen, it has static and dynamic sized vectors. Mm -hmm. 
Our proposal lives at this address. Perhaps someone could put it in the chat. It's known as the syntax proposal to separate it from the BLAS proposal. Now, the purpose of the proposal, as I said, is to reserve some identifiers and provide infix operators. Note that there is another library in Boost called QVM, short for Quaternions, Vectors and Matrices. This also defines adapted traits for converting between different libraries, which is something that could be added to the standard library subsequently. Indeed, this proposal is actually very small in scope. It's tiny. I say it's tiny. Others might disagree, but it's as small as we could feasibly manage. Um, we expect others to build on top of it over time with many other linear algebra related functionality operations. So let's take another pause for questions and I shall take some more water from my glass. Lots of people drinking from bottles, I see. Glasses for the win. So let's look at the proposed library and consider what customizations we will need. Now, when we declare a matrix, the obvious thing we want to be able to do is specify the type. We also want to specify the arrangement of elements. So here is an example of a trivial matrix. Looking at that, you may be able to guess that it's a matrix of floats arranged in three rows of three columns. Unfortunately, we need to accommodate matrices whose size is not known at compile time. So this represents two different storage strategies. In the paper, we call these storage engines. Let's talk about designing the storage engines. With compile time storage, we're very fortunate. We know how many objects we want to store and we know how big they are. This gives us an object that looks like this. The templates are the type, the number of rows and the number of columns. But with runtime storage, we need to know about the type and the allocation. We can't parameterize the row and column count. So we need an object that looks like this. So this leads to a typical usage that looks like this. So this is a bit of a mouthful. We could use aliases to help, but we still have something of an additional teaching burden. We have two types of storage engine to talk about. Now you can see our aliases using geometry equals automatic storage, flow through three, and then stood math matrix templated over geometry. However, this problem has already been solved. A rather elderly proposal, P0009 from September 2015, encountered just this problem. It started life as paper N4355, but we changed to P papers with revisions in 2015. I'm going to do what you should never do and read the slide and the next two, so do bear with me. It's important. So from the first revision, multi-dimensional arrays are a foundational data structure for science and engineering code, as demonstrated by their extensive use in Fortran for five decades. A multi-dimensional array is a view to a memory extent through a layout mapping from a multi-index space domain to that extent, range. Traditional layout mappings have been specified as part of the language, for example, Fortran specifies column major layout and C specifies row major layout. Such a language imposed specification requires significant code refactoring to change an array's layout and requires significant code complexity to implement non-traditional layouts, such as tiling in modern linear algebra or structured grid application domains. A multidimensional array view abstraction with polymorphic layout is required to enable changing array layout without extensive code refactoring and maintenance of functionally redundant code. Layout polymorphism is a critical capability. However, it is not the only beneficial form of polymorphism. The proposal specifies a new class called extents, which is an n-dimensional descriptor for describing the size of an array. It also defines a constant called dynamic extents to represent extents not known at compile time. In fact, during the development of the proposal, we were encouraged to take a lead from MD-SPAN in interface design. 
we are now in the position where MD-SPAN can be used to implement a part of the linear algebra library. Anyway, back to matrix storage engines. And our class is starting to firm up. We can now specify a static or dynamic storage engine with this prototype, like this. And this. And this is preferable since we have isolated the dynamic versus static choice to a single parameter within the template. But we have one more thing to pay attention to, and that is the layout, row major versus column major. So you will recall the discussion in the original abstracts to P0009 about array of structs versus struct of arrays. Now, beside the issue of C versus Fortran specifying different layouts, some hardware benefits from particular orientations. P0009 comes to the rescue again with the matrix layout type. So we have row major and we have column major. Now, on to the next problem. This is a simple enough piece of code. But what would you expect to see on the standard output? Ah, 3.5. There is a very convenient aspect of C++, which is implicit conversion. The left-hand operand is of type int, while the right-hand operand is of type double. There is no operator plus taking an int and a double. Mixed type arithmetic is not directly supported. But the compiler is allowed to perform an implicit conversion on the operands to find a suitable overload. There are precedence rules, and you can find them on cppreference.com, and they are surprisingly detailed. Now, the preferred int conversion is from int to double, now, this may be troublesome if the int cannot be represented as a double, as indeed many of them can't. But still, that's what we have. Let's look at another example. We're putting a complex number to standard output. What will this print? It prints open paren 3, comma 3, close paren. I haven't specified any formatting, to include decimal places or leading or trailing zeros. What about this? Well, it still prints paren 3, comma 3 paren. The complex number is templated over int. This doesn't actually have to work according to the standard, but you know, it can work. The constructor is looking for a pair of ints and the compiler converts the doubles to ints. What about this? Well, it still prints 3-3. Three, three. The compiler converts the doubles to ints by truncation, not by rounding. What about this? Well, now it prints 7-7, seven, seven. and this surprises some people. Why hasn't it converted to std complex float and printed 7.7, 7.2? What about this? Well, now it prints paren 7.7, 7.2, close paren. Now, Note that I initialized a complex of floats with a pair of doubles. The conversion takes place at construction time, and then the addition takes place. What about this? Well, now it prints 7.7, 7.2. What happens here is the compiler converts the doubles to floats by narrowing rather than truncating and the ints are converted to floats. And this conversion will happen at compile time here since these are literals. What about this? This does not compile. What's going on? Well, simply put, the operators aren't defined. If you want them, you define them. The built-in types that are part of the language are fully defined, as are their operations and conversions. 
Stood complex is not a part of the language, it's part of the library. Defining operations for a few possible specialization a few possible specializations of stood complex might seem wrong. Now, my co-author and I disagree, and we think this is an oversight. But there's an even more fundamental problem to solve in our case. Here are two storage engines with different element types. Here are two matrices with different storage engines. What should the type of M3 be? We think this should be legal. If you can add two different arithmetic types together, then you can add array, an array of them together, member-wise. And if you can add an array of them together, then you can add a matrix of them together. And if you can add them, you can multiply them. Matrix should behave like the built-in types. And to achieve this, we need to work out a way of managing the promotion. To do this, we must, at compile time, examine the template parameters and for each difference, work out a common type. So for example, if we have an operand storage engine with a double element type, and the other operand storage engine has a float element type, then the result of any arithmetic operation is going to be a storage engine with an element parameter of type double. Now, obviously, this is an exercise in template metaprogramming, quite a hefty one as well. And there is a whole talk possible on how we achieve this. But there's a slight problem. When it comes to allocation, if either operand storage engine has an exotic user-defined allocator, there is no way for the compiler to, to infer a common type. We therefore have to expose another parameter to the matrix definition the matrix operation traits. So for each of the four operations, we have three traits, element promotion, engine promotion, as an arithmetic trait, which I'll come on to in a moment. Now, during compilation, the traits class is used to form the resulting type of the operations. In the usual case, it's to be hoped that classes T1 and T2 would be the same, making the entire process quite trivial. But where they are not, the appropriate trait is selected to infer the correct promotion. So we update our basic matrix class to accommodate this operation trace parameter. So there are now two parameters. The first is the matrix storage engine, templated over type, extents, allocation, and layout. And the second is the operation traits, describing element, storage engine, and arithmetic promotion traits. But why would you want customize the arithmetic traits. Well, let's take a look at multiplication. At worst, to multiply two n square matrices requires n cubed multiplications of scalars and n squared minus n additions. That means the complexity is O n cubed, although there are cache considerations to bear in mind that aren't a part of complexity calculation. The ubiquity of matrix multiplication has inspired a lot of research into superior algorithms. Is anyone familiar with Strassen's algorithm? That has complexity of O n to the power 2.807. I'm, I'm just reading a number out here. I don't know how you calculate fractional complexities, but I do know that there has been a race to minimize this number over the past 50 years. And as of 2014, that complexity number has reached n to the power 2.3728639. Indeed, there has been research into Gaussian elimination, matrix inversion, and determinant calculation for the same reason leading to all manner of handy algorithms for particular circumstances. We cannot therefore require clients of this class to use a particular algorithm. So this gives us our third customization point the set of algorithms you want to use for operations on matrices. You may decide on an expression templates implementation, or you may decide that the compilation burden is too great, it is quite large, and decide on something more naive or prototyping. Now your custom operation traits may only specialize one particular aspect. So here we have imported the addition element promotion and storage promotion traits and we have supplied our own addition algorithm traits, 
called Custom Edition Arithmetic Traits in the last line of the struct. So to summarize your customization options, you declare a basic matrix. Then you choose a matrix storage engine. Then you choose an element type. You choose an extent using a single row or column for a vector or dynamic extents for runtime decision making. You choose an allocator if you want the objects to have dynamic storage duration. Choose a layout. And finally, choose your operation traits. Interestingly, this solves the complex number problem in a rather roundabout way. By declaring two matrices of dimension one by one, you can use that machinery to do the appropriate promotion. And I'm defaulting to row major storage here. The type of C3 will be complex scalar over double. I've left a lot out here, so I'll pause for some questions. Right, let's look at some applications in colour, which may you may find this unexpected, but it's actually quite important. So what colour is this? Pop it in the chat window. Now, I know this is recording and I can't see the chat window, but I'm going to guess everyone put red or dayglow red or bright red or painful red or some variation on red. But how about this? Hmm, I'm hoping that there was some disagreement over what colour this is. Well, apparently it's orange, according to PowerPoint. I don't think so, and nor may you. Perhaps it depends how your monitor is calibrated. But PowerPoint says this is orange. And the problem we have is one of subjectivity and context, the root of all ambiguity. Now, the first thing we need to observe is that perception is logarithmic. Differences at low levels are more significant than differences at high levels. And this is fundamental to, to human behaviour, in fact, fundamental to all behaviour. It's evolutionarily advantageous. If you're being tracked by a predator, hearing a footstep in near silence is valuable. Whereas if 30 beasts are chasing you, hearing a 31st isn't valuable information. The same is true of sight. If you perceive the amount of, of light cast by a single bulb, and then suddenly another bulb lights up, the effect is noticeable and it will consume your attention. On the other hand, if you perceive the amount of light cast by eight bulbs, adding another one isn't going to make much difference to you. This is about the difference between contrast and brightness. Contrast is more useful than absolute brightness. Mechanical vision is linear. Um, and you should say, you know, mechanical is in quotes, or vision rather is in quotes, because it's not really vision. It's photons hitting, in this case, a CCD. And this is a diagram of a CCD chip. Vision, really, it's about apprehension and understanding and parsing and contextualizing. And that's why it's logarithmic, because that's what's most useful. Machines just count photons using natural numbers. And actually, they don't even do that. They take a sample rather than counting the entire number of photons. That would be quite hard. The interesting information is at the dark end. Remember, contrast, not brightness, is important. So to improve sampling at that end of things, we store the square root rather than the value. And this gives us more values at the bottom in exchange for fewer at the top. I'm actually overgeneralizing here. It's not the square root. It's in fact x to the power of somewhere between 1 over 1.8 and 1 over 2.2. This number is called the gamma value. More on this in a moment. Low gamma samples more evenly across the spectrum than high gamma. 
So low gamma is good for bright pictures and high gamma is better for darker pictures. You store the gamma correction out of band in your data so that you can decode it properly. But what about colour? Well, there are two kinds of light sensitive cells in the eye, rods and cones. Rods apprehend lower intensities, while cones apprehend brighter signals and also specialise over particular electromagnetic frequency ranges. There are in fact three types of cones specialising in different ranges. They are labelled S, M and L for short, medium and long wavelength. As you can see from the picture, the S cones respond to shorter wavelengths, being at about 420 nanometers, and there are fewest of them. They make up about 2% of the cones in the human eye. The M cones make up about a third. They peak at 530 nanometers, and the L cones make up the majority and peak at the longer wavelength of 580 nanometers. You can see red, green, and blue as the primary colors here. And three types of cone makes humans trichromats. Although originally we were tetrachromats until genetic mutation got in the way. I've heard it suggested that Van Gogh was probably a tetrachromat. Interestingly, women are much more likely to be tetrachromats than men, but they are non-functional tetrachromats. And there's only been one documented example of a functional tetrachromat. She was found in 2016. So with three cones being the general case, we only need a vector of three values to represent all human vision. And what we need is a way of transforming these electromagnetic emissions into perceived colour. So to do this, you must take a standard human, put them in a standard environment, and then measure how they perceive electromagnetic waves via matching the colours of lights. Then build a function that maps electromagnetic wavelengths to human perception, giving three values, x, y and z. Then constrain this function so that all values are positive and luminance ranges from 0 to 100. Now this was actually first attempted in a series of experiments in the late 1920s. The results were combined by the Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage I'm afraid I don't speak French, I hope I haven't butchered that, which in English is the International Commission on Illumination. Anyway, they combined into the CIE RGB colour space, from which the CIE XYZ colour space was derived. Now, not all values are possible. The ranges overlap. For example, S and L cannot both be zero. Engineering is messy and real life. In the vector space, defined by this colour space, contains impossible values. Now, we apprehend brightness separately from colour. So let's create a colour space to reflect that. We can normalise the values so that we have two values representing colour and a third value for relative luminance, informally known as brightness. It's important to emphasise that Y is the relative luminance by deliberate choice. So now we have a two-dimensional colour space that we can vary by brightness. And it looks like this. This is the XYY colour space, also known as the CIE1931 colour space. The figures in blue are the wavelengths. X and Y vary between 0 and 1. Now this diagram displays the maximally saturated bright colours that can be produced by a monitor. The area is called the gamut of human vision. Some interesting properties emerge. All visible chromaticities correspond to non-negative values of X, Y and Z. If you choose any two points of colour on the chromaticity diagram, then all the colours that lie in a straight line between the two points can be formed by mixing these two colours. An equal mixture of two equally bright colours will not generally lie on the midpoint of that line segment. In more general terms, a distance on the CIE XY chromaticity diagram does not correspond to the degree of difference between two colours. Also, if you choose three sources, you'll get a large range of colours. However, you won't get the full range of colours visible to humans. This shape is not a triangle. There really is an awful lot to learn about this. Um, and I recommend checking Wikipedia for an introduction to CIE 1931 colour space. Wikipedia is 
after all, the fount of all human knowledge. I just want to call back to the earlier discussion on how we perceive brightness. Perceptual uniformity is a property where a small change in a value has the same effect in perceived colour, regardless of what the value is. The values in this colour space are not very perceptually uniform, which makes it inefficient. Now, there were three further attempts to achieve this, but they still exhibited some distortion. Now, in 1996, Microsoft and Hewlett Packard created the sRGB standard. It's a standard. I'm not kidding. The International Electrotechnical Commission formally identified this in 1999. It's often the default colour space for images that contain no colour space information, especially if the image's pixels are stored in 8-bit integers per colour channel. This colour space is designed for monitors, printers and the World Wide Web. As you can imagine, it is the most widely used colour space. sRGB defines the chromaticities of the red, green and blue primaries, the colours where one of the three channels is non-zero and the other two are zero. These primaries are defined in terms of the CIE colour space. They're based on the colours of the phosphors in cathode ray tube TV sets. You'll remember those if you have grey hair. You might wonder if it's still relevant now that CRT devices are all but extinct. However, you can make a tri-stimulus display that conforms to sRGB without using phosphors. You can use LEDs of the same colour. In fact, you can use any materials as long as the primaries match. So let's take a look at the gamut. The triangle in the middle is the sRGB gamut shown within the CIE1931 gamut. It is all the corners you can see, colours you can see on an sRGB monitor. Each corner of the triangle is a primary defined in XY. It defines what R, G and B relate to in sRGB in terms of the absolute XYZ definition. Now you might be thinking to yourself, hang on, what about the colours outside the triangle? I can see those. Well, those colours are actually wrong. Um, this triangle in the middle is the, is the correct values, whereas the colours outside are merely interpolations caused by dragging the, tri the points of the triangle outside to the extremes of the shape. It's a, it's a representation, because after all, this image is drawn using sRGB. The truth is, we can't represent those colours on an RGB monitor or a projector. Don't get me started on Adobe RGB. Now, the sRGB standard also defines a transfer function between the intensity of these primaries and the actual number stored. The function is non-linear, and that word non-linear is really important. I'll come back to it in a moment. The x-axis contains the stored value from 0 to 1. Now, if you store the value as 8-bit integers, it would be from 0 to 255. On the right-hand y-axis, also ranging from 0 to 1, you have the intensity. The red plot is the sRGB intensities versus the sRGB numerical values. And behind the red curve is a dashed black curve showing an exact gamma equals 2.2 power law. And as you can see, there is more detail at lower values. The upper half of the intensity spread is represented with only about a third of the stored values. Now, on the left-hand y-axis, you have the effective local gamma. The blue plot is the function slope in log-log space, which is the effective gamma at each point. The gamma cannot be expressed as a single numerical value. The overall gamma is approximately 2.2, which is the line at the top. Particularly, 2.2 is the median value. That's the value at half intensity. However, the whole gamma range consists of a linear section near black, below a linear intensity of 0 0.00313 where gamma equals 1, and then a non-linear section elsewhere involving a 2.4 exponent and a gamma changing from 1.0 through about 2.3. The purpose of the linear section is so that the curve does not have an infinite slope at zero, which would cause numerical problems. So what does this function look like? All hail. The first line creates RGB from XYZ. This is a simple linear transformation by the power of matrices. 
But that isn't enough. We then have to do the gamma correction. And this comes in two parts, depending on the range. For small intensities, simply multiply by 12.92. But for larger intensities, you can see the rather unpleasant activity of taking the fifth power and then the twelfth root. The third and fourth line are the reverse operations going from RGB back to XYZ. I think you'll agree that this is computationally expensive. So in summary, brightness perception is logarithmic. XYZ defines absolute perceptual colours. The XYY colour space is linear. Linear interpolation is valid on linear colour spaces and sRGB is defined relative to XYY. But the transfer function is not a linear function and it's expensive. sRGB is non-linear. Which means that linear interpolation is invalid on sRGB. So we've taken a look at the theory of colour management measurement, we've learned about the linear and non-linear colour spaces, and we've learned that sRGB is non-linear. What could possibly go wrong? Thank you for asking. Here's a simple piece of interpolation. x plus y over 2. I'm trying to find the midpoint between x and y. Now, what if the data being stored is in fact the square root? Square root of x plus square root of y over 2 is not the same as the square root of x plus y over 2. We can prove this by considering x equals 9 and y equals 16. In the first case, we have 3 plus 4 divided by 2, which equals 3.5. Whereas in the second case, we have the square root of 25 over 2, which equals 3.535. The incorrect calculation has a lower intensity than the correct calculation. Believe it or not, midpoint is a remarkably subtle expression and easy to get wrong. Again, if you saw Kevin's talk on Thursday, you will have heard all about this. Now, Marshall Clough actually told us all about it in his talks in 2019, so do check them out. New for C20 is midpoint, and also LERP, which is the more general version of midpoint. So what does this look like in practice? Well, the top bar is a correct interpolation between red and green. The colour range has been correctly transferred to a linear colour space, interpolated, and then returned to the original colour space. The bottom bar is an interpolation without transference. It is non-linear. It looks like a sludgy mess. It's too dark in the middle. And I hope you have good bandwidth, otherwise this might actually look a bit blurry. But the important thing is, the incorrect interpolation is dark. The correct interpolation is even. Now this is an 8-bit sRGB perceptually linear ramp, incorrectly taking a round trip through 8-bit linear colour. And you can see that the darker colours experience severe banding. This is quite a significant precision issue. The effect is known as posterization. And this entails the conversion of a continuous gradation of tone to several regions of fewer tones, with abrupt changes from one tone to another. And you can see such an abrupt change in the leap from 0 to 13. The leaps get smaller as the intensities increase. You will recall that sampling is at a much higher resolution at lower intensities. So you would expect the error to be much more profound at those levels. Now, this was originally done with photographic processes intentionally to create, pro to create posters with reduced colour depth. Wikipedia tells me it now can be done with digital image processing and maybe deliberate or an unintended artefact of colour quantization. And it sounds like a rookie error, doesn't it? You wouldn't expect this in professional software. Sadly, I have to ask you to think again. My colleague, James Barrow, rolled his sleeves up and surveyed the landscape of code that uses colour. His results were very, very disappointing. He looked at LibSDL, SFML, Dear in GUI, Flash, Unity, Godot, 
and ogre. They all got colour conversion wrong, interpolating badly, not documenting the choice of colour space, or being deliberately evasive with vague documentation. They were not supporting gamma correction properly, or they were just plain wrong. Undaunted, he continued with CryEngine, which contains six different representations of colour and no documentation. MATLAB, which assumes you are using an NTSC colour space. OpenCV, which makes the same assumption. SVG and CSS are wrong by design. Just let that sink in a moment. I'm going to quote Eric McClure. The amazing thing here is that the W3C is entirely aware of how wrong CSS3 linear gradients are, but did it anyway, to be consistent with everything else that does them wrong. It's interesting that while SVG is wrong by default, it does provide a way to fix this via colour interpolation. Of course, CSS doesn't have this property yet, so literally all gradients and transitions on the web are wrong because there is no other choice. Even if CSS provided a way to fix this, it would still have to default to being wrong. It seems we have reached a point where, after years of doing sRGB interpolation incorrectly, we continue to do it wrong, not because we don't know better, but because everyone else is doing it wrong. So everyone's doing it wrong because everyone else is doing it wrong. A single bad choice done long ago has locked us into compatibility hell. Sound familiar, C++ programmers? We got it wrong the first time, so now we have to keep getting it wrong because everyone expects the wrong result. This is a council of despair. QT, or cute, isn't too bad, handling everything fairly correctly, in fact. But the highest praise goes to Unreal Engine, which has a linear and non-linear colour space, offering interpolation API only in linear colour space and fully documenting its choices. So you can't get it wrong. With the interpolation only offered in linear colour space, you will only correctly interpolate. Help is at hand in the form of a proposal to standardise colour. And you might ask why? Well, it's been a long time since you could buy a green screen or monochrome monitor. Coloured text on a monitor has been available as standard since the last century. All you need to do is power up a Linux shell and type ls to see coloured text in action. It's a very useful cue for differenti differentiating information. Here, blue is for directories and green is for files. Unfortunately, you can't write this in standard C++. You need to bind to a separate colour implementation for your platform. One criterion for considering something for inclusion in the standard library is if it's hard to get right. For example, it's very hard to write concurrent queues, and such an entity is being proposed for specialisation. It can't come soon enough, in my opinion. As we saw from the earlier parade of misfortune, it seems to be very hard to get colour right. And of course, before we do this, we need to have some linear algebra in the standard library. Let's take a moment to answer some questions. Right, let's look at some applications in geometry. So geometry is my main use of linear algebra. It's an ancient endeavour. It's the branch of mathematics concerned with questions of shape, size, relative position of figures, and the properties of space. It was also a favourite topic of mine at university. I want to draw attention to two people whom you will have heard of. The first is Euclid, and the second is Descartes. Now, I hope all of you have read Euclid's Elements, all 13 books. It's actually quite an easy read for the sort of person who's going to attend this talk. And there are a lot of pictures. Up until the beginning of the last century, it was presumed, certainly in England, that anyone who was educated would have read it, not necessarily in the original Greek, although that would have got you bonus points. I found a PDF, but bound copies to improve your bookshelf are easily available from Amazon. 
Here's the first of 48 propositions, which arrives after 23 definitions, five postulates, five common notions, and a diversion on the third person present perfect imperative in my translation. It's contained in book one. So there, clear as the river Thames. Here's the English version. This is actually how to construct an equilateral triangle given a finite straight line. What you do is you create two circles of the radius of the straight line. You put their centres at either end of the straight line, and where those circles intersect is the third point of the triangle, since all points of the circumference are equidistant from the centre of a circle. Magnificent. Elements set the tone for mathematics, and it has looked pretty much like this ever since. Definitions, postulates and propositions. Now, geometry got us a long way in road and canal building, navigation, architecture, astronomy, all sorts of human endeavour. But it wasn't until the 17th century, nearly 2000 years later, that the next great leap forward happened. This was the work of René Descartes, one of the founders of modern philosophy. He's probably best known for mind-body dualism and a particular Monty Python song. We're more interested, though, in his contribution to mathematics. Now, according to Descartes' biographer, the story goes that during the night of November 10th and 11th in 1619, while stationed in Neuburg an der Donau, Descartes had three dreams, and he believed a divine spirit had revealed to him a new philosophy. Particularly, he formulated analytical geometry. It's hard to overstate the impact Descartes had on mathematics, but this isn't a history of mathematics lecture. I'll let you research that yourself, but it really is extraordinary. It's fascinating. Analytical geometry works by introducing a coordinate system and giving every point in the plane a pair of real number coordinates. Now, if this were a film, you would hear some cellos and trombones playing serious music. Now, this foreshadows a significant problem with geometry and programming. More on that in a moment. So the most common coordinate system is the Cartesian system. This takes the real number line and rotates a copy through 90 degrees. So each point is re represented as an ordered pair of distances along each axis, horizontal then vertical. Each axis is orthonormal. Less common is the polar system, where each point is represented as a distance from an origin and an angle of rotation. This is incredibly useful when working with rotations, but not so much when looking at straight lines and linear motion. Also, orientation is problematic. Do we measure clockwise or anti-clockwise? Mathematicians go clockwise from y equals zero, because the number line goes left to right, while engineers go clockwise from x equals zero. If clocks had been invented in the Southern Hemisphere, it would be a different matter, as clockwise and anti-clockwise would be reversed. Of course, this can be extended into three dimensions by adding an additional axis, or indeed any number of dimensions. I'm not going to cover that here. The treatment of a torus as a four-dimensional object, one of my favourite moments at university, blew my head off. But now that we have algebra to work with, we can start doing work using equations and models rather than pictures. So let's start with a straight line. Now, rather than as Euclid did, drawing a straight line on the page and simply connecting it to other lines and curves, we can define a frame of reference and describe a line as a set of points satisfying particular properties. Here we have a line. It's the set of points x, y in R, the real number field, such that y minus 2x minus 3 equals 0. How do we algorithmically compute the full set of points? Well, thanks to algebra, we can rearrange this equation to that, y equals 2x plus 3. All we need to do is go through every value of x and retrieve the corresponding value of y. You will recall from your elementary education that these two constants have names, the gradient and the y-intercept. This gradient is what allowed Newton and Leibniz to come up with differential calculus. So let's look again at the general form of the linear equation a1x1 plus blah 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 plus anxn equals b. But we can migrate this to the 2D plane with a little substitution. So here, a1x1 plus a2x2 equals b. More familiarly, we can turn this into ax plus by equals c, which becomes by equals negative ax plus c. 
And since b and negative a are arbitrary constants, we can see that y equals mx plus c, the very familiar equation for a straight line. So we can see that any straight line can be represented with a linear equation. Generalising to three dimensions, you can see how this would work for planes. Now, representing a coordinate pair as a vector, x, y in parentheses, we can translate scale, shear, reflect and rotate this vector. Translation takes place by adding the translation to the coordinate pair, like this. Scaling works like this, either by a scalar multiplication, or we can achieve the same effect with a matrix multiplication. Shearing means scaling x and y by different amounts, which we achieve like this. Reflecting means multiplying a particular ordinate by negative 1, like this. Rotating is slightly more complex. Say we want to rotate the point around the origin by pi by 4 radians. Algebraically, this requires the following operations in this diagram here. We can represent this using, the, represent this, using this matrix, cos A negative sine A sine A cos A. It works like that. I'm sure you can do it in your head, it's easy. Now, the linear algebra proposal offers a matrix class template. The API is dull and interesting, there's nothing at all remarkable about it. It's exactly what you would expect it to be. It should not require teaching if you know what a vector and a matrix is. And this is the point of an API. The template parameters are far more interesting. We can specialize for fixed size vectors and matrices of size two or three or four floats. Of course, I'm not the first person to decide that what C++ needs is a geometry library. We must consider the prior art. So let's look briefly at Boost Geometry. This venerable library has been part of Boost for about 10 years now. Baron Gerrels, who works at TomTom, Tom, wrote this. From the introduction, Boost.Geometry, aka Generic Geometry Library, GGL, part of the collection of the Boost C++ libraries, defines concepts, primitives, and algorithms for solving geometry problems. Boost.Geometry contains a dimension agnostic, coordinate system agnostic, and scalable kernel based on concepts, metafunctions, and tag dispatching. On top of that kernel, algorithms are built. Area, length, perimeter, centroid, convex hull, intersection, clipping, within, that's for a point in polygon, distance, envelope, for finding the bounding box, simplify, transform, and much more. The library supports high precision arithmetic numbers such as TT Math. Boost.geometry contains instantiable geometry classes, but library users can also use their own. Using registration macros and traits classes, their geometries can be adapted to fill, fulfill boost.geometry concepts. Boost.geometry might be used in all domains where geometry plays a role. Mapping in geographic information systems, games development, computer graphics and widgets, robotics, astronomy, all sorts really. The core is designed to be as generic as possible and to support all those domains. But for now, the developments have been mainly geographic information systems oriented. But this gives us a starting point. So let's look at what's on offer. First of all, Boost Geometry is dimension agnostic, using the same interface to support 2D and 3D operations. And note that the linear algebra proposal is also dimension agnostic. It also, it's also coordinate type agnostic. So it can use integers, floats, anything you choose, just like the linear algebra proposal. So this is feeling pretty good so far. So we have dimension and type agnosticism. And let's consider a distance function. So we want the shortest distance between any two things. For example, two points, a point in a line, a line in a polygon, a point in a polyhedron. And these will all have different algorithms. Calculating the distance between two points simply requires the application of Pythagoras in the appropriate number of dimensions. The point line case requires extending the line projecting a normal to the point and seeing where the intersection is, choosing the closest endpoint if there's no intersection. However, 
This is not really any different from the linear algebra case of addition, but different shapes of matrices demand different addition algorithms. Again, we have a parallel with linear algebra that we should be able to exploit. Boost geometry also offers functionality independent of coordinate systems. Indeed, everything is looking pretty rosy. So let's consider how we can model geometric objects in C++. The mathematician will tell you that a line is a set of points satisfying a particular qualification. For example, the x-axis is the set of points x, y in R such that y equals zero. However, it's not a line of finite length. There are no end points. More useful will be a line segment with two endpoints. So for example, let's consider this line segment starting at negative 3, 1 and ending at 5, 5. This is the set of points x, y in R, such that negative 3 is less than or equal to 5, and y equals half x plus 5 over 2. Now how might this be modelled in code? Two ways spring to mind, a struct with the gradients and the y-intercept for a non-finite length segment, or a struct with two endpoints. Now, I'm being a little coy here. I've been describing everything in terms of the set of points in R, but of course that's not actually a domain available to us on a digital computer. At best, we can only hope for the set of points in Q, and even then, we can't span that with built-in types. There is not as yet a rational type in the standard, nor are any processors exposing that sort of thing natively, to my knowledge. If you know any different, please do tell me. I'd be most interested. For example, we can't represent 3244.7482 using the float type. Anybody know why? The answer is, in, is one of precision. Floats are only precise to about five orders of magnitude. And this is what I was foreshadowing earlier with mention of trombones and cellos. How do we represent the set of points in a straight line? What are we trying to capture? I think we can agree that a vector of non-integer pairs would be a bad idea. For example, there are four billion floating point numbers, but apart from that, there is no guarantee that for each x value, the corresponding y value is available in the float domain, as I just demonstrated. Well, there's a gradient and there's an intercept with the y-axis, so that should be enough for representing a line, a class called line with two floats or doubles, or whatever you're using for your number line, one called gradient, one called y-intercept. But we very rarely deal with such abstract things. Usually, we're dealing with line segments. So we need to constrain the class still further by adding the bounds to the line. We might want to imply direction with P begin and P end. So our constructor would include two points and work out the gradient and intercept from those points. Having said that, you might be left wondering if the gradient and intercept are necessary. If they're easy to calculate, is caching, caching each gradient and intercept worth it? And that depends on how you expect to use them. In my domain, we only care about the endpoints. All the rest is lazily evaluated. Of course, we can extend this to Bezier curves if we want. That's another talk though. Let's finish this diversion with the most knotty topic in computational analytic geometry, intersection. Two lines intersect if they cross over. Two polygons intersect if they overlap. We need to be a little more rigorous than that though. Recall that a line is a set of points. So two lines intersect if there is a point that is common to both sets. So let's revisit two lines. y equals x minus 1 and y equals 2x minus 4. Do they intersect? Well, they aren't parallel. They have different gradients, so they must do. Subtract one from the other, and you get 0 equals x minus 3, which means they intersect where x equals 3. So far, so good. Let's try another. y equals x squared and y equals x plus 3.9. So we do a bit of maths, solve a quadratic equation, and you'll see they intersect in two places. 0.5 plus or minus the square root of 16.6 over 2. That square root is a problem. That number can't be represented on a computer. It's not a rational number, and only rational numbers can be correctly represented. It's worse than that. Consider these two straight lines, y equals x minus 2.3 and y equals x over 3. They intersect at x equals 3.45. That number can't be represented in binary floating point arithmetic. There is a fundamental problem with total war. 
We model field warfare on a large scale. Battlefields are about 10,000 metres square. Combat takes place at a much finer resolution. How many centimetres are there in 10,000 metres? A million. If we try and model that using five orders of magnitude, we could get that wrong. And hitting or missing units would fail completely. We would need to use a type with greater precision, but that would mean either doubling our memory budget for the coordinate system by moving to double, or losing our hardware advantage by moving to a custom type in software. Of course, we could move to integer maths and work entirely in millimetres. Four billion millimetres will get you from London to Ankara, rather larger than our usual battlefields. And that would send our artists and tooling folk mad, of course, because they work in system international units. You really are in a lot of trouble when it comes to intersection. How do we deal with a perspective function like bull intersects line A, line B? Well, the thing is, we can't. What we have to do is add an additional parameter to describe a tolerance. So who knows what the difference is between flut min and flut epsilon? Well, flut min is the smallest number that can be represented with float while flut epsilon is the difference between 1.0 and the next float representable number. Epsilon is used in maths to signify an arbitrarily small quantity. If you want to see if two points are the same, we will need to specify how, how samey they need to be. Since some noise has already been introduced by the sampling the plane, we need to account for that in our functions. So our function will need to look, need to look something like this to allow an error tolerance due to sampling. Now, one of the things I always look out for during code reviews for new starts is the presence of direct comparison of two floats. That probably isn't what they meant. Dissuading people from using the equality operator on floats is a tough job. Now, I would be very keen to get a colour and a geometry library into the standard, but they are going to be feasible without linear algebra, which I hope will make C++23. In these COVID days, the rate of progress of development of the standards has declined. Some might say that's a good thing, but it may be C++26 before this proposal sees the light of day. So that's everything. I hope I've covered all your interests. And please do take a look at the proposal. A new revision will be along real soon now. Many thanks for your attention. Please ask me some questions.